This conference will now be recorded. I'm going to talk about the overview, uh, logistics, and the type of work. XYZ Rail and Tibbles, formerly Stobart Rail, undertook and completed the works from the 1st of April 2016 the 18th of December 2018. The work bank was made up of the following four distinct work types. So there was re railing, uh, predominantly bill head, uh, spot re slippering, timbers, uh, re padding, and re base plating. XYZ Rail were also given legacy works, which involved removing redundant materials from locations along the Cowell and Wick lines, and it included 5,000 metres of rail. So the XYZ contract team, there was a network rail, SPM, there was a site manager for network rail, and uh, we worked in Inverness in an integrated management office. Um, working so close together became critical because of the experience in network rail being the ex-section manager and the SPM with over 35 years experience, and the determination in the plan operations of XYZ Rail to successfully deliver the project. So the work sites spanned across the Kyle Line, uh, which is Inverness to Kyle of Akalsh, the Highland Line, which uh, we worked down as far as King Craig up to Inverness, the Fuzzle Line, which is George Miss Junction to Fuzzle Station, and the Wick Line, which was uh, from Inverness to Georgemus Junction. Uh, so the project cost 11 million, used over 740,000 components, 59 sites with only 11 delay minutes and one boat. So Thurzo uh, is a re-railing work site. So the Thurzo line was to be re-railed entirely, which was six miles long. That equates to 1,056 times 60 foot bullhead rails, and it weighs a total of 830 tonnes. If the rail was delivered by road, it would be 53 articulated lorries with rear steer, which would have difficulty travelling on A9 as it is a single carriageway with extra chains at the very rear grades. This would hinder the, the deliveries, let alone the increased environmental impact. Organising through rail delivery trains, it was uh, instantly a negative due to capacity on the network. And the team was planning year two, six months in advance, and Fuzzle was the first site that we had to uh, complete. So delivery was one of the uh, major issues, but along with that, it included the location, welfare for the team, weather, the existing infrastructure, faults on the line, and, uh, and then tying into existing rails from new rails each night of the works. A bit about the Berrydale Grades, which was um, the point that stopped this tra transporting by road. So the Berrydale Grades um, up on the, towards Wick uh, has a steep gradient, 13% gradient on either side. And then there's a hairpin on the north side. Um, what they did to improve it after obviously we'd finished was March 2020, they improved the road to remove the hairpin. You can see the white articulated truck there, how tight it is, it stops either uh, vehicles going until that turns the corner there. So back to Fuzzle. So the solution. So the order for the rail was placed in the system and meetings were held with the supply chain. The rails are produced in Germany, so we held conversation with a delivery firm and it would cost the project £15,000 to deliver 1,150 rails and a separate boat from uh, to Scrabster Harbour. By road, it was estimated over £50,000 for delivery from East England, where all rails are delivered for Britain. The team visited the harbour master at Scrapster Harbour, who walked the area, trying to identify storage areas uh, and even using their and even providing use of their cranes and plant that could assist. We uh, visited a crane hire company, Hugh Simpson, which is located in Wick, and they assisted with the offloading of the rails from the boat, and they also transported from the harbour to Fuzzle Fuzzo Station, which is a, about six miles. Uh, and uh, you had to deal with a small town, Fuzzle, and also small roads. 
so they were the right company to use because they were local. They organised road closures and they organised all movements and lift screws. XYZ Rail took ownership of the station compound area and set up welfare and storage areas with the rail successfully being delivered under budget, environmentally friendly and safely. So for construction, we peaked at 40 rails per night and stolen by hand. There were good outputs on site. With only 12 dry days and the 12 weeks it took the team to deliver made it even more impressive. XYZ Rail reduced the current faults on the track as well. During the amp tent walkout, we submitted a TQ due to the lack of ballast throughout the branch line, and it was agreed, and we also dropped and profiled 800 tonnes of ballast. This was the first time the rail had been delivered to a port, other than principal trans-European routes, straight to the site. It was also the first delivery to a Scottish port. So a £95 pound bullhead rail. So the difficulties working with bullhead rail was uh, the experience of installing it and removing it. Typically, flat bottom rail is, for, is used throughout the country. So install, installing almost 40,000 metres of bullhead rail was going to be a task. XYZ Rail employed three X, X network rail, rail staff from the Highlands who had combined who had a combined 70 years experience in the area. And it was pivotal in showing the entire team the process for removing and installing the head rail. There was not one work site that didn't involve something that hindered a direct remove install process, and through the AMP process, it was identified. The safety critical during the walkouts, we used the X Network Rail staff in order for them to see the work site so they could provide key methodology solutions so the task would be as easy and safe as possible. When putting new rails and tracks, sometimes greater than 10 mil worn but none existing, it was necessary to start off with closure rails of various wear depths. As works progressed, the least worn rails on a site were kept, they were cascaded, delivered onto the next site. As a result of this, there was not one shim put in at any time. There were also a dedicated grinding team for minimal blending in of the closure rails. We'll talk about Strome Ferry, which is located just uh, west of the Isle of Skye, and it's just almost to the end of the, the line at Kyle of Kalsh. Ferry. Strome Ferry was a particularly difficult re railing site to complete. The radius was 250 metres with non compliant check rail. The check rail did not extend 9 metres beyond the transition with flares. XYZ and Network Rail came up with a solution to use serviceable rail from another re railing site on the same line for the check rail. The gauge was non compliant, it was too wide. We could not install half the curve as it would leave a gap as you have to install with the joints opposite to each other. The team re railed with the high leg during one night, which was 15 rails, and then the next night increased the team from 15 to 20 for the difficult method of lifting the new rail over the check rail and clipping up. We had a site manager uh, with a programme on site as it was a high risk of overrun. So he was checking uh, the progression constantly so he could remove this risk and uh, we could clip up if there was a potential to overrun and perhaps leave a defective joint to joint length for one day and then come back in the next night to fix it. The team were so successful that they installed the check rail base plates to increase the check rail from transition and install the flare on the same shift that was actually planned for the next night. So the joints, so um, the fish plated joints. So year one and two, the fish plates with the uh, our, uh, traditional round bolts, washers, and spectacles to remove the terminal bolts that are installed. This was a lot of components per joint, and constantly we'd be accidentally dropping them, or they'd be missing, we'd not bring enough out with us, and the team would have to revisit to, to ensure compliance. There's also a lot of extra components to take to site, where access has been scarce as well, and having to travel to work site up to a mile from the nearest approved access. XYZ Rail periodically checked for solutions. As Billhead Rail is almost never used anywhere else in the infrastructure, it's difficult to find. Then, in year three, 
a new hard lock stay tight bolt became available on the market and was approved for use. Renovation. So year three was a year for innovation against fish plates installation with cost saving of 10% per standard bolt and would give the section managers less maintenance where this bolt was used. Hard lock nut is designed to resist loosening by vibration, enhances safety and improves reliability. The hard lock functions by utilising two nuts that work together. The cone in the lower nut is offset, so that when tightened against the upper nut, vertical and horizontal locking forces engage the screw thread. The rail was delivered drilled at one end only, but without holes being cold, hole, uh, cold bolt expanded or CBX. This is a notorious task with plant breakdowns and a requirement to crop and drill uh, due to holes being off the square. 6,600 holes were CBX'd on the Far North project, and there was only one hole that was wrongly drilled. I'll show a quick video. Well, let's jump in. Jamie's is playing just to remind everyone that if any questions, just to um, ch put them onto the chat forum. I see we've got one already, just to put them onto the chat forum. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Right, OK. So on the timber slippers, so question is installation by hand or mechanical means. So there was a team of 10 with varying, comp varying competencies to replace sleepers by hand. An RRB delivered the sleepers in packs of 20 throughout the work site and the team then had to install by hand. It wasn't cost effective to use an RRV on many of the sites. Typical night shift on the wet line was half 10 till 0400. And the team would install 18 sleepers per night, including taking the smalls to site from the access, replacing the timber, cleaning the site area, strapping the redundant timber sleepers together, and then coming back off track. Accesses were up to a mile away from the place of work, and due to the length of some sites, had to be mechanically packed. To uh, during the planning phase, some sites were planned using a side insertion attachment, which could replace up to 55 sleepers per shift keeping the track alignment until a tamper arrived at the end of the completed work site and consolidated the site. Video. This is a Ross Keen.
So in that video, was Ross Keane week 33 and still in uh, our 54 hour weekend uh, disruptor. So, um, what you can see there, uh, the crane controller, is he's actually standing on the rail, on the head of the rail. And uh, what we've done is we spoke to the crane controllers, we undertook a task, uh, a toolbox talk, and then we made sure that that uh, standing on the head of the rail was removed. Don't need a bit of logistics. So, Fort Annard, Scots Calder, George Miss. Um, so, you can see Wick there to the west, Fuzzle in, in the north, and um, uh, sorry, Wick on the east, then Fuzzle in the north, and Fort Annard Station up to George Miss is through, through the country. Uh, I've shown you accesses uh, 125, 15, 18, uh, and then George Junction at 147. That's two twenty-two miles, and there's uh, two axes, accesses in between that area. Uh, one thirty-three, sixteen seventy-two, out in a break, and one four-three mile post at uh, Scots Calder. We had a re-railing site uh, at Scots Calder at one three nine uh, nine hundred to one four one mile post, but we couldn't use out in a break access, nor could we use Scots Calder access. It was due to various contractors over the years falling out with the RSPB who owns the land coming up to Force and Ard, uh, for out of break access. And also there was someone living at Scots Calder Station who just refused his access. Uh, so we had to uh, deliver uh, 131 lengths of rail from uh, George Miss. So it's only 80 miles up the road from Inverness. Oh, that'll be two and a half hours drive. So the area is beautiful. Lots of locks, wildlife. But getting to accesses for certain sites be very difficult. So delivering an RRB with attachments, hundreds of sleepers and rail, crates and crates of components, all had to be meticulous. We planned in advance the road closures if required. And we had to collaborate with councils, local delivery unit, heritage associations, roads department. We were on individual sites for up to eight weeks on an 11 on free off roster system and we ensured compliance with welfare and fatigue. Working on Helmsdale to Josmas section, we employed welfare vehicles with toilets at accesses that were within one mile, one mile of work site, but some sites were seven miles from the nearest access, namely both in Arden's Scots Calder. We used uh, gators with personnel carriers, cabotas, and uh, tracks Mercedes welfare van to have welfare directly on site each night. Also, some team effort because it has been so remote. So, Saturday, August 2017, the team were preparing to access a site to carry out Mossford families when recently friend between Garv and Act Machine. On the Kyo line. Upon arrival, the section manager was a guard, and uh, there was a landslide, and it had taken out 200 yards of ballast and washed it into a log locker. The team offered assistance, and within four hours, had an RRV on site with 200 tons of ballast and a team of eight working alongside the MDU to return the line back to train running by the Monday morning. The quick thinking of the XYZ rail supervisor to phone the on call, get the go ahead to assist. And also having a good relationship with section manager meant that it was a limited stoppage to train running. Gav, uh, the access at Gav was in a village uh, next to the railway station. It was used by the maintenance delivery unit as well as other contractors. We had to ensure capacity for redundant sleepers, but also for NSC Hyab to collect the sleepers. This access would not hold the full capacity, so we actually had to use Rogie Falls level crossing, which is situated in a forest for storage. Keeping the sites clean, clear, assisting the relationship between XYZ Rail and the local section managers. And uh, the Garve work site was uh, three miles, and it was towards Rogie Falls from Garve Station. On the Highland Line, we had King Craig and Kinrara, they were repadding sites. 
So we've had it on a, a CWR track on the Highland line. Sounds like a simple task, but not when it is during winter with no access. The work site was over five miles long, including repadding 13,000 stubs using 26,000 pads and 52,000 insulators. This is where having a network rail site manager, who is also a former section manager on the island line, comes in handy, as he visited the section and the signal box where we obtained an area of land within that area to store materials. Upon walking the site, looking for accesses, we came across the out of use access steps, which would have been ideal for the said rail team to access and egress. So Network Rail SPM submitted applications to reinstate, which was agreed, and the XYZ Rail mended the access, which is still currently in use, not only for the Farm Off project, but now for the NDU. Clear and clear, these two photos were taken before and after a uh, periphery burn, roughly the same area. Uh, the before is just, just a little bit further up the track, a couple of lengths. You can see the tidiness, you can see the difference in how uh, formerly uh, Stobart Rail, XYZ Rail left that site. It was one of the first resleeping sites to be carried out. 762 sleepers were replaced. Walking with section manager, it was clear the area had been neglected by other contractors and even redundant materials on site. XYZ Rail did not want to follow the same pattern. We wanted to make a difference. Here are some of the components we used, which uh, made up the 740,000. Uh, you can see there, pan rolls, pan locks. Overall, so what could have been better for us overall? So it was too short a time for the contract award to the start of the works. Not all the sites were scoped, having a specification for the sites. Some of them had to go out with like a part specification. Uh, S and T, that was a that was that was difficult for us. We don't have an in-house S and T division. So trying to get a subcontractor up there. Uh, year one, part of year two, we, we used the network rail S and T which helped us, but then we had to had to, had to bring in some subcontractors. Uh, we couldn't source local labour. We had to bring the labour up from Glasgow, Edinburgh, um, sometimes Carlisle. That handled with, with costs against accommodation, travel. We had to think about fatigue management. And what went well on the project. So we completed all the sites. There was a high quality of work produced and the tidiness. Uh, winning over the section managers uh, due to having a tidy site at the end, that really helped us. Uh, speaking with them, having monthly meetings with, uh, with the TME, that helped us. Um, we had daily conference calls and the fuzzle boat really brought the project into light. Uh, the ORR actually visited uh, a revealing site um, at Agnesheen, and there was not a single action or observation by them. Uh, and as I said, the CBX and six, over 6,000 holes were drilled. And um, working with NSC for the uplifts of the scrap uh, rail, scrap uh, sleepers, uh, with, with Archie Hogg for NSC. That was that was uh, that was that worked really well. Uh, just coordination, just speaking to each other, and that is the farm off project. Excellent, Jimmy. Thank you very much. Uh, it sounds quite literally like uh, location, location, location. You know, and and a lot of the issues within that. Um, we have. Um, we have a big audience tonight. We've, we've over forty people on, and we've got a, um, a few questions to start with. Uh, so before I start the questions, if you if you do have a question, 
um, please just type it into the chat box and we'll make our way through the questions to uh, Jamie as we go on. So feel free to type in. And um, Jamie, if I could start off with the first question, please, from uh, Bob Gardner. And Bob was asking um, about the, uh, he noticed, I think, deep skirted fish plates were used. And he was asking if, if that was the, um, the general fish plate used throughout. Um, from what you've seen in the photographs, were the deep skirted plates used throughout the joints? Um, or? Yeah, what I remember, I'm pretty sure we used the deep skirted uh, throughout. I, I can't remember changing. Yeah, I think it was deep skirted all the way. Right. Again, a standard plate all the way through, nothing changing really. For it was more the bolt changing. Yeah, it okay. was the. Okay. Um, uh, a question from Tracy Chong. Um, Tracy was asking about the um, fish plate fishing surfaces. Um, if they were actually oiled uh, before installation the, the, um, on the fish plate contact areas, or were they done kind of after installation? And you just kind of so they were the done. Element? They were done during um, for year one and part of year two. Use the traditional, uh, the traditional method, where the maintainer has to has to re uh, oil every six months or a year. They have to kind of maintain it. But then on the market, there there was this oil that you could use, um, that you don't have to do that. I can't even remember the name of it. I can't remember the name of it. I didn't like, but it was um, you don't have to actually take it off, and it was because of these bolts as well. Stay tight bolts. You don't actually take them off. Yeah. So was, was it more of a, a, a clear lubricant, a kind of potentially like a spray on style lubricant rather than a traditional black oil? Is that what you were kind of? Yeah, it was um, black. It was a uh, yeah. It was um, we had to paint it on. We don't. I don't think we sprayed it on. Right. Right. But they were certainly on before installation. By the sound of things, you were saying yes. Yeah. Okay, probably. Um, we have another question from Simon Thomas. Um, so th Simon is saying that given the difficulties in, uh, of logistics and the transport uh, on a night-to-night -night basis, um, was it considered to do any of the works um, in a blockade um, in a sort of daytime access basis? You know, especially we given the the kind of the, the light usage of the, the lines of that, was that something um, you, you had within your control or indeed a kind of thought about if that was a possibility? Or so what we done, so what we done was um, in, the, in year one is we asked the question and we actually got involved in week 32, 33. Uh, it was more a disruptive, not a blockade. It was, I don't think there was any kind of blockades that we could actually utilise our works. Um, so it was more like a, like a disruptors. I remember week 32, 33, year one at Ross Keane, we sleeper in. Uh, because that was an area where uh, track times at night shift was um, about half 10 to 4 in the morning. Uh, with limited accesses as well. So we utilised that disruptor and work back to back ten hour shifts in order to uh, install sleepers. But not any kind of blockades. We we never got the opportunity. Sure, sure, yeah. And, and I suppose as you as you were kinda of lighting to and your lessons learned and everything, if, if you had if, if you had a similar project again, was that something you would kind of push towards, you know, trying to uh, trying to achieve, I suppose, is that do you think that would be an advantage? You know, from the uh, uh, kind of a network and overall system point of view. Yeah, I mean, you definitely get the job done in a blockade. Uh, it's just as a as a cost effective as a um, can it be planned? Uh, because it's only one in three days sleeping, or uh, it's only a section of rails, a half a mile or a quarter of a mile. A couple of nights, um, or even weekends. Obviously, you can get um, 
a good time on a Saturday night, you know, so you can actually kind of tackle and kind of get all that done rather than a, a big blockade. Due to far north, there were 60 sites, but not all of them were like six miles long. So they were a lot, lot smaller, 800 yards or so, you know. Okay. It just depends on the type of the, the work. Okay, right away. Um, got a few more questions. Eh? A question from Douglas. Eh, he says, Hi, eh, thanks for the presentation. I think I know what Douglas that might be. <laughs> it brought back some good memories. Good to hear, good to hear. Um, so, looking back on the lessons learned, um, if Network Rail were actually um, to package up and tender works in this, um, of this nature again, have you any views? And we spoke a little bit on access there, but you any other views on? Um, anything which you would you know do differently or could be done differently you know if you were to do it again and that's again the, the wider picture you know so yeah anything so that you kind of thought year three so year two it was a uh, patch in the back for fuzzle the boat coming in for the rail for fuzzle if we'd actually looked okay. a year and a half ahead to year three we actually had a, a quite a lump of re-railing up that area as well so instead of getting the 1150 rail delivered, we maybe should have got it doubled and delivered. And I think that would have been a lot better uh, logistically to get that rail to that area. Um, sure, sure. Yeah, I think that would have been... Um, yeah, so the, the material stuff, and anything with regards to the kind of... The, the plant usage that you kind of learn as you go on, you know, the more RRVs or less or more manpower, anything with regards to yeah. that element at all? Up, up in the far north, it was the experience of the people in that area. You know, That's once uh, Inverness, you've obviously got network rail uh, in Inverness, so I think well, Helmsdale, like a small group and that. But for contractors, the closest was Glasgow or, or Edinburgh, you know. Um, so that's a three and a half, four hours to Inverness just to get there. Yeah. So doing something differently, trying to get experience, trying to um, buy in with, with people up in the far north area or a secluded area, you know, and trying to get sure. them experienced um, in order to, to undertake this type of work. Okay. Okay, thanks, Jimmy. Um, yeah. We have a question from Bob Garner. Uh, and Bob is asking about the um, if there was any feel for the the amount of eighty five pound the, the older traditional rail versus the ninety five pound slightly newer. If you could, if that's right to say, <laughs> if there's any idea of um, how, how much eighty five pound. I, I, I recall in the past there were big, quite big campaigns to try and get rid of the very old eighty five pound rail. But were you aware of the amount of um, Eighty-five pound rail coming out versus ninety-five, or we never really, we never really took any kind of figures for the eighty-five versus ninety-five. Sure. Uh, sure. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you how much. You know, uh, lubrication. Yeah, we lubr we, we lubricated the joints and um, the chairs. Now, as I mentioned, the stool ferry for the chairs, um, which check wheel chairs. Uh, and we had to install them in order to extend the check rail uh, through the end of the transition for nine meters, and then install install uh, chairs for the flare. Uh, but apart from that, we had to do yeah. chairs at Bun Crew. We had to um, change the, the uh, chairs at Bun Crew. Uh, that was a massive project, and. Um, yeah, not very many other kind of places. I, I do recall the local PWA were always worried when there was a, a blockade in that uh, of the islands in the far north of that because the um, the, the weight of a, a bullhead chair was was very handy for a lobster pot to keep a lobster pot <laughs> down so that often they did go missing and uh, <laughs> when, they were, when they were lying about or something like that. So the local uh, local mm. fishermen always found them very helpful. You know what I mean. Um, um, we have a, or a more serious point. We, we have another question, um, not from Tracy Chong, uh, as I've been corrected. Um, it's actually um, uh, Tracy Chong is the organiser, and it's Tom Wilson, our, um, our vice president for Scotland. 
uh, was asking about um, jointed ballasted track with a, a full shoulder above the sleeper. Surely not, is his, <laughs> is his comment there. Um, and, and I'm sure, Tom, Tom as you'll... Um, as you'll understand, uh, some of the things you see up in the far north of Scotland is kind of beggar's belief, right enough. But uh, at least they went on the the um, super cautious on the side of safety. Yeah, it was quite a shoulder. It did look like a sort of half decent embankment there, right enough. But uh, yeah, but he he did um, he did have another sort of point to that and a bit of lessons learned and extra supervision. And he was asking if that was kind of relating to the quality of the installation. Um, or output or something else there, what, you know, if, um, what the extra supervision, where the, um, the benefit of that really came from? I think it was more um, in the, I think it was more kind of in the office, uh, I think management kind of supervision, kind of uh, planning at a site level and then going out to deliver. Uh, we never really had that kind of um, multiple people to do it. And in year one, we had three work sites every night. So that's three different areas along that 250 mil route. So you're, you're constantly uh, issues or um, you're having a um, plan in case something went wrong or in case something happened differently to what was planned. And I think it was more yeah. that kind of supervision of three different work sites. Uh, year two, we went down to two work sites, and then year three, we went down to one work site. Um, and it was more that kind of keeping on top of it, especially in year one, with supervision and um, providing the correct information in order to, to, to either replan or to, to provide assistance when necessary. I think we, we kind of lacked that in the kind of first year before we. We started kind of um, getting better and better, you know, as time went on. Sure, sure. Okay. Excellent, excellent. Um, let's go through the other questions. Uh, Bob Gardner was asking about if you were aware of the oldest rail that you replaced. Um, I, I know sometimes when you're stripping out rail on a night shift, you, you, you know, got little or no time, and I do recall <laughs> kind of trying to find the rail years up there and then. Um, it was pretty difficult. Well, most of them did start with a 19 right now, but you found the odd one that was, that started with an 18, and he's got really worried. Um, so, was there anything you were particularly aware I remember, of? I remember um, walking for an amp, uh, an amp 10 or amp 12 in the 1965, I'm pretty sure. Uh, that, was, that was pretty old. Um, it was uh, The reason why I remember that is because of the 50 year lifespan. So, 1965, we were like, Ah, it's it's, uh, it's it's definitely um, earned its money, you know. But uh, yeah, 1965. I don't remember if it was in the 40s. I, I, yeah, 1960s is what I remember. Kind of, we were kind of talking about. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's such a mix up there, isn't it? The, the stuff you get um, kind of pre-war stuff and everything um, it starts becoming that corroded and that worn you know it's, it's very yeah, hard a lot of it's been turned as well yeah so a lot of it was turned uh so your 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 sideware was um i was was looking pretty kind of yeah i got something difficult to tell times. <laughs> 85 pound rail from the 95 pound rail when it gets that head worn <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely yeah um, there was a comment here from Andrew Anderson, just um, just to kind of clarifying that the RS Clear track loop now comes back to me. Now, thanks, Andrew. Is um, ah, is either yeah. a paint on or a backpack applied? And again, he's just confirming that it's good for two years as well. Yeah, so that's, yep. it's only rings a bell. Uh, the product name. Thanks, Andrew, for that. Um, a, a little comment from uh, Jim Watson. A, a question. Sorry, uh, Jim was asking Jim spot the sleeper in. Did you experience any issues with gauge management um, set to design or adjacent type of thing? So, uh, yeah, a tricky old place, isn't it, up there? Um, did, uh, was that yeah. been a common occurrence of that? So I, 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 um, I showed my presentation to, to a couple of the guys who'd worked on the farm off with me, and I asked that to them because they were on site every night, you know, the handback engineer or, or some of the kind of, the kind of labour force, you know whenever I, I, I introduced this and asked that question, but they couldn't 
tell me for definite that they came across any uh, any difficulties with the gauge. I'm sure I'm sure there would be. But I mean, I did I did ask a question and stuff like that. But they all said, especially with track handbag and stuff, they, they did kind of tell me that there was nothing uh, major uh, difficulties. Apart from, pardon? Oh, sorry, on you go, Jamie. On you go, sorry. Uh, Strong ferry in the specification, it, it did say white gauge, you know, but I think that was more to do with the rail um, because of the uh, radius. Sure, so there was a kind of design widening through the, the tight radius curve then by the sound of yeah. it to a certain extent. Uh, uh, and I think sometimes you kind of find in, in um, these kind of routes that there's a little bit of both. There's a little bit of kind of easing over the years, and and a little bit of kind of design weed uh, gauging, you know, to, uh, on the very tight section, the tight radius of the curves and everything like that. I suppose the tricky part is um, it, maybe the guys would have found is um, you know, um, doing spot re sleeping through a curve and when it is wide and and how you manage that transition every night, you know, between the um, the tight cut the or the in the inner textbook gauge, you know, and um, where it's where it's an existing gauge, you know, where it's reasonably wide there, and how they sort of manage that as well. And because we have had instances, you're probably aware of in the past, where people have came in, and especially when they're doing a very short, small, localized re sleeper, and potentially even at joints or whatever that, and they've been thrown in at 14:35 or something, and then suddenly you've got a nice wide curve, and then suddenly a tight spot, and then a wide spot, and a tight spot. Yeah, but they, they sound like yeah. they managed to kind of get around that anyway and, and um, do a sensible kind of approach, a transition approach. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Bob Gardner was also asking about um, a feedback from the section managers now that the track has been in service for the last few or three years. So, uh, did you get a chance more recently or anything to, you know, to see how things are, are holding up and everything? Any, any chance to get any feedback or is it? Is it all relative? No, 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 um, you have no received any kind of kind of feedback, you know. No news yeah. is good news, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> sure, yeah. I'm, sure, yeah. I'm sure I'd hear uh, about it. If, uh... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very true. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it sounds like it's always a, it's always nice to get some form of yeah. feedback. That, you know, but as you say, if, if, um, it's good. There's no negative stuff coming back as I mean, well. Anyway. I uh, I walked the last site uh, for Amp 16 uh, with the section manager just outside of Dingwall. And whenever I walked it uh, at the end, he actually turned around to me and he says that he was um, going to be sad that Stobart Rail were going to be leaving the area. He said he was um, very impressed with how we handled it and how we provided yeah. um, the end product. You know, sure. so that was that was nice. I remember, I remember that it was great, especially I uh, absolutely fantastic to hear. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, there's an interesting question from Steve Clark. Uh, so Steve was asking, could um, timber sleepers uh, in a section be replaced with concrete to potentially reduce the amount of future maintenance and give greater longevity there? Um, not the case, obviously, when you're spotty sleepering. Um, or consideration for use of composite sleepers if the conditions allowed. And I, and I know you were kind of um, you were given a kind of scope and that yourself, you know, to, to deliver that was, the remit was already agreed. But any thoughts yourself, Jamie, on um, you know concretes would that have been practical yeah, or would? It, yeah. I mean, up there the EMG TPA is, is, is quite low, you know, so. Um, that expense of uh, installing concrete uh, for timbers, I don't know if it, if it kind of weighs out. Uh, there was sections with concrete sleepers up there, uh, but we were we never got involved. Uh, there was actually a, we actually got a reduced specification because uh, some of the track went and some of the job we went to the place concrete for timbers, but that got removed from us. Okay. Uh, because uh, we're putting some TQs, can I ask him a question, you know, uh, what's the benefit, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I certainly recall, um, I'm sure a lot of people on the, the call probably had a bit of experience of that, when the, the jointed 
um, concrete's that were on jointy track, you know, and generally got completely destroyed at the joints. Um, and it, often, you know, a kind of hardwood timber would be put in in the place to kind of give them a bit of um, help at the concrete sections and that. But I suppose the other part of that question was using um, composite sleepers uh, and as we push further and further towards, uh, you know, higher recycling and, um, you know, a reduction in natural products, you know, I mean, um, uh, it's maybe something for the future. I, again, it's probably a specification part as much as anything else, but, you know, sometimes the um, the delivery teams can actually push them along to the clients themselves. Have you ever had any experience of using the kind of composite sleepers at all? Or is that something you would be interested in maybe trialling? Or? It'd be nice to trial, yeah. I've not really had any kind of involvement um, doing that. But yeah, definitely would be, uh, be nice to kind of have a look at it and see if it was beneficial. Sure, sure. I've um, got a few more questions, if that's okay. Uh, another question from uh, Tom Wilson, uh, about one three spotty sleeper in. Um, any idea how much life this approach will bring back to the track asset? Okay. <laughs> uh, I, will the older sleepers need to be removed later? Um, or will the, um, will the next intervention be entire oh. renewal? It's so we're doing one management of... question there. Yeah, we're doing one in three, and what we've done instead of just doing uh, one, miss two, one, miss two, is when we walked down the amp ten or amp twelve, we actually said to them, "Well, what, what's the worst sleepers? What ones do you want us to change?" Uh, as you can see, we're well packed, so we still ch kept the track alignment until the tamper at the end, you know. But we could try and increase life expectancy, stuff like that. Yeah, we we tried to kind of say to them, well. Instead of official one and three and taking it slippers, which maybe don't need to be taken out, let's focus on the ones that need to in order to try and improve the track so it's, so it's less revisited later in, later in life, you know. Sure. Uh, sure. At Osinard, um, we actually installed, um, was it, it was either eight or nine hundred yards um, of slippers completely just outside of Osinard because it became apparent that that area coming out of the station heading north was, was really poor. So we did a one and three, we turned back to the start, two and three, we turned back to the start, three and three. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully that's kind of that's kind of held up. Sure, yeah. It's always a tricky one, isn't renewal. it? Renewal. Yeah, yeah, doing a full renewal yeah. of the area rather than a one and three, especially if it's a large area, uh, I think is much more beneficial. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, and it's, it's, it's always a tricky balance because you, you'll appreciate the, the geography up there, the scale of the, the, the task in hand and spreading the jam type of thing to, because these routes are reasonably fragile and, and there's never enough money to go to do everything, eh? so it's, um, yeah, yeah it's, it's a tricky one, but well done and kind of not um, using up all the spray paint in the first mile and running out of your application before you get to that end because it's it's a very <laughs> tricky job, isn't it? You know, I mean, it's it's um, yeah, you kind of learn quickly on how to how to actually spread it out. Yeah, so well done. Um, we have a couple of few more questions. Um, Bob Gardner was asking that the um, was the total length of uh, forty thousand meters rail. Uh, rail length, sorry, or track length. Was that the overall length of the rails, or was that rail length? Um, you know, rail, rail length. Rail right? length. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's a, it's a fair old whack of rail, isn't it? Yeah. Sure. Um, a, a question from Peter Halliwell. Hi, Peter. Um, how much of the new rail uh, was used in in the works, and there was any left for ongoing maintenance in the oh, areas yeah. renewed? So. so um. Is it? So what we've done, so um, I think it was something like 3% extra rail per site we tried to, uh, we got the client to provide us because of off cuts, so we can go centre bed for cuttings, you know, stuff like that. Um, but at the end of the job, there was only nine rails left at the end of the works. Nine full rails, that was only 0.25%. The whole job. And, uh, yeah, and that was new new rail, I presume. Yeah, new uh, ninety five pound rail head rail. Yeah, sure. Um, 
and, and from the, the the material you took out, um, was there any kind of? I suppose that was a second part of that question. Was there any salvageable, you know, sort of reasonably serviceable bits that were able to be left for maintenance for the future at all? Did, was because bit, so sorry to interrupt. Because yeah. the network uh, management, one of them was like um, like an ex manager. He was very um, very keen to kind of see what was uh, required to be renewed rather than just what was in the spec. You know what I mean? So so sometimes we'd kind of move a little bit. You know what I mean? And not as long as obviously the jobs and stuff was right. There's one site we actually reduced by 50% because that rail was still um, was still good to use. So we, so we actually, instead of just doing what the job what it said, we actually kind of thought about it, made inquiries, TQs, Stuff like that, we try to try to do the right thing, you know. Yeah, that's it's good to challenge that. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it was always an old trick for people moving mileposts to get the correct location. <laughs> but, <laughs> thankfully, we don't do that very much nowadays. <laughs> um, there was a question from um, Andrew Anderson. A couple of questions there, um, asking about um, when you were trying to get Czech rail uh, chairs um, for Strong Ferry. Did you were were they Difficult to get the network rail of a strategic supplier, or was it something that squirrel stored away, or is it any? I remember it being difficult to get. I remember them being pretty difficult to to obtain. I can't actually remember if we went through Unipart or if we went and um, acquired them for a section. I cannot remember. Sorry. Yeah, no, no problem at all. No problem I mean, at all. I maybe remember. maybe. I a kind of smallerish number, it might have been able to get you know locally or something, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Andrew, the second part to that, just uh, about the the softwood sleepers type of thing. Um, if they were kind of pressure treated, crisoted, I suppose traditionally, or with another preservative used there, uh, is it? No, oh, they had to clear so one and sign on them. Where do we start? Okay, yeah, yeah. So right. that's as much as I know about the the clear so on them. Right. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's good. I, no, it's good. Yeah, yeah. I, I do recall um, kind of seeing them um, timber sleepers that were getting used on the Long Gannet uh, branch once by uh, on the private sidings, and uh, yeah, it was kind of it, it was certainly timber, but that's it. You know, there was no kind of treatment at all, type thing, which was and it was kind of softwood, right. so it, yeah. I, I didn't give them much time to to last, really, unfortunately. But that's good. And they got treated um, uh, timbers there. Um, Another question from Douglas. Uh, um, the reality of it is that local section managers are now completing spot resleeper works through many of the same sites. Um, full resleeper treatment should have possibly been specified by the network rail initially. Uh, feedback from maintenance has been very positive as they revisit the site. So I can a comment, uh, I suppose, from Douglas that, yeah, we're still on the kind of do extra kind of work and, um, and, and it probably adds on to that question before about, you know, thoughts on, you know, was there certain sites you um, you think there should have been more? And by the sound, of it, there was one in particular where you just had to kind of do everything that you have from the kind of experience on site. Um, and I think Douglas is going to say in, um, that uh, the installation of hardwoods next to softwoods, um, noting that, um, Hardwoods are getting yeah. installed there as well. So was it all softwoods at the time you were using? Because it was with softwoods, yeah. Yeah, I remember um, at the end, uh, well, 2019, it was had to be hardwoods now, yeah, I'm sure. But yeah, softwoods is what we used. Okay. It was probably something to do with a very uh, m miserable uh, sponsor at the time, or uh, maybe myself even, only only paying for softwood, you know, so you could probably blame me for that. <laughs> 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 uh, is that a quick question from uh, Frank Roach, um, uh, and he was just saying, um, it was actually a comment just saying it's, uh, uh, um, it's been a brilliant presentation, uh, he's, he's had to, to leave, but I'm just saying thanks for the presentation. Uh, <sighs> um, a note from Roy Hickman asking if you uh, consider using the Geismar uh, Thai sleeper changer um, against an RRV, so I'm not too sure if you've seen that machine before, it certainly used to use it in the past sometimes. Um, no, I've, it, no, I've not seen that, I guys my, I guys my old yeah. Thai machine. 
Uh, um, well, it's, it's a kind of as in like, like a, a sleeper, you know, an American name for a sleeper, a tie type of thing. And um, there, there was a piece of kit, um, if I remember rightly, it was a kind of suite of about maybe three or four RRVs. And um, they, they, they were specifically for, I, I think they actually trailed them in the West Highlands, if I remember rightly, um, maybe about 10 years ago. And they were specifically for a uh, spotty sleeper in. So it, it, was, it was fairly heavy on the, um, the plant point of view. Um, and that you know, there was a number of machines, but they were pretty. Once they were up and running, they were pretty quick. And indeed, um, if you were if you were replacing concretes and even in kind of tight rock cuttings, which are also challenging, um, it was a piece of kit. So it's maybe a, an interesting one for yourselves. And um, as I suggested by Roy to maybe have a look at the where is the the guys market now? You know, so certainly Network yeah, Rail I think, sponsored it for a few years. Uh, it's a really good question. Oh, where, where is that sitting somewhere in a in a lockup somewhere, not getting used? And, and indeed, you know, um, is that something that uh, you might want to to look at? So I'll I'll try and hunt out some stuff for you because it was certainly um it was used in I'm sure West Highlands and then no doubt the other parts of the country as well. Um, oh yes, please. Yep, that'd be good to see. But, but Roy's just updating that, saying the um, network will still have the two that guys might manage themselves so yeah I can maybe catch up after and get some details and and then um, see if that'd be something that you could possibly utilize for the future thanks for that Roy cheers um, uh, just a comment from Jim Watson from the Glasgow section just, uh, thank you Jamie for uh, an interesting presentation and uh, and uh, discussion um, and Anne-Marie sends the best regards <laughs> <laughs> um, it, and a, a sort of final point for Roy, just he was saying that it does um, 30 sleepers an hour, this piece of kit, the, the guys, I remember when it was up and running, it could produce some pretty good uh, well, numbers. Well, yeah, but um, um, we'll, we'll look out some information for you, Jamie, and that, because it, it might be well worth it. There's another kind of work package coming up in the future that, that could be something that could be utilised itself, type of thing. I mean, so... Yeah. Um, yeah, that type of uh, thing. So, um, thanks for that. I think we're um, uh, unless there's any other questions, I say if you want to um, pop in uh, any last questions, folks, um, that would be that would be great. I, one thing I wanted to ask myself, Jamie, just finally, um, um, having been the, up the out in the break in Scots Corda, Scots Corda can kind of access roads, and gee whiz, it's something mm. else. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's, and then the huge walk once you actually drive it eight miles or so along a dirt track, you know. But did you find that um, did you find that any of the sites in particular um, were always the kind of, if you like, the maintenance headaches, you know, the difficult sites that were getting left and left, and these were, <laughs> was that the case or that or you know? I think so that, uh, I think fifty percent at least were the headache sites that we had to tackle. Um, Try to think. I mean, that Thurzo branch line, that six miles, and there was a lot of faults on that line. And um, yeah, we removed quite a bit of them. And uh, yeah, that was that was a headache, but it was a, it was really good to see the end product. Um, there was one site right in Inverness had seized clips, which was a nightmare. Uh, okay. We're using a Melville cutting machine, and. Um, that, that couldn't even do it. This Melville was, um, was like a strawberry clipping machine. And right. uh, we, 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 at this thing, we were using lube, we were using spray, we were using all sorts. Of, just couldn't get it. That was a nightmare site. Actually, had to t change the actual spray instead of just uh, repadding there. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, there's a few, definitely a few out of the 60, which are at Strong Ferry. That's when I meet a radius uh, to a check rail. Coming around that to the rail, that was that was pretty difficult. Uh, the experience of the guys on that side were was was the key. And their buy in, actually talking them through the site, getting them to buy in, really was 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 um, beneficial, you know. Sure, you know? sure. Excellent, Jamie. Um, thank you very much, Jamie. It's been brilliant. Uh, if I could, um, I, I like uh, to pass over to. Um, uh, Phil Benz, eh? Phil, if you're there to um, propose a kind of vote of thanks, if, if I could ask that. Thank you again, Jimmy. <clears throat> thank, thank you. Russell, yes, uh, here I am. Well, yeah, thank you, Russell, and thank you, Jamie. 
Um, yes, as I've been listening to your presentation, I mean, what, what's come over to me is the, the benefits of the collaborative approach which you've adopted with, with Network Rail. And also, uh, it's good to see the variety of sites featured. Um, I think a highlight must be, as you've said, um, the focus on the first order Georgimus section and the relaying of that and the supply of the rails for that, that work. And also, um, you highlighted the Georgimus to Forcinard section, which um, I, I'm aware of personally of, of being a particularly remote section with a summit at County Marks, just north of Forcinard. And I'm sure that must have been particularly particularly challenging as, as, as part of the overall works. Um, so I would like to, on behalf of the section, uh, both sections, uh, say thank you very much for your presentation, which I think we've all enjoyed, and perhaps we could express our appreciation as normal. Thank you. Oh, thank you thank very you. much for having me. <laughs> it's a virtual clap. It's a new one. Well done, Jimmy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, just a, a quick um, one before we all leave. I know there's football on tonight. Everyone will be keen to see that as well. Um, the the um, we, we're hopefully the we're hopeful we'll get some form of kind of alternative. Edinburgh section virtual technical tour next month on Friday the 4th of December type of thing in place of a kind of regular event uh, at that time of year. So please look out for the section email for the Edinburgh section uh, or contact myself or Matt Taylor and um, we'll hopefully kind of see you guys there. But thanks again, Jamie, and thank you everyone for uh, calling in tonight. Uh, have a safe uh, night tonight and good to see you and I'll hopefully see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.